We'll just give a panel discussion about pensions um, and the opportunities for wealth tech therein. Obviously, the pensions landscape's changed an awful lot over the last couple of years. So it'll be interesting to hear from the panel what kind of opportunities they think have arisen from that for wealth technology. But first, I'm going to get everyone just to introduce themselves, explain a little bit about their companies and what they do. Um, so, Richard, it looks as if you're the man in the hot seat. Do you want to start off by just introducing yourself? And sure, I'm Richard Flax from Money Farm. Um, we're a digital wealth manager. Um, we will, should be launching our SIP product imminently. Hi, hello there. I'm the founder of Wealth Objects. It's a B2B a technology platform for organizations to launch a fully automated or a hybrid uh, automated uh, robo advice or hybrid advice solution to get to the market faster at a fraction of the cost. Uh, we treat this as products for the long term. Yeah. Uh, Simon Binney uh, from Wealth Wizards. So we uh, develop. Um, financial planning and uh, technology-based advice technology solutions. Uh, we uh, white label those for the large advice um, financial service brands, so banks, life companies, building societies and large advice businesses uh, for them to promote their advice. Um, and we also work um, with large corporates directly to engage their employees in advised savings. My name is Charlotte Ransom. I'm CEO and founder of NetWealth. Uh, we're a discretionary wealth manager that launched in May last year. Uh, we don't really fall into the robo-advice category per se, since we have advisors uh, available to clients who want advice, and we also have humans who are deciding on the asset allocation over time. But we are technology-enabled, so the price point is more in line with the robo-advisors, so we're probably a, a half to a third of the typical industry average. And our clients are typically sort of 40 to 60 year old professional people. And what's been interesting for us since our launch, uh, well over 50% of our assets are held in tax wrappers of some description and over 50% of that are actually in SIP wrappers. Um, and I think that's partly down to the technology we've been able to provide to make this a, you know, an easier journey for people and, and one that they feel is more in, in their control. So, I mean, so the panel, in terms of pensions, obviously the pensions freedom rules are the biggest thing that's changed in pensions over the last couple of years. Um, and that's clearly given people a lot more options, but also increased the complexity of what they do when they come to retire. So, I mean, I'd like your views on what you think wealth tech has to offer here that the traditional providers don't. Uh, Charlotte, do you want to start as you're obviously kind of closer to the sharp end on yeah, this? I mean, Obviously, I think it's really exciting in terms of pensions freedom, um, and it has meant that there is a far greater focus from people from the, from the investing community in terms of what's out there. Um, the way that I think about it really is sort of controlling the controllables. So when we think about pensions, there's a bunch of things that are out of our control, what the markets do, what inflation is, our longevity. That's those are all things we can't control. But there's a bunch of things we can. Um, and the way we think about it is, first of all, being diversified, which for long-term investment planning, we believe is the right thing to be. Um, you can also control being in a tax wrapper, choosing to be in a wrapper, and then you can control the price points. And I think, you know, if I'm a 45-year-old who has got a 250,000-pound pension board, <clears throat> and I'm contributing 700 pounds a month, and when I'm 65, I want to draw down 30,000 pounds a month from then on in. Um, if you don't have that money in a tax wrapper, then it'll last you about 17 years. If you have it in the tax wrapper, it'll last 22 years. If you then pay 1% less than you would pay an average asset manager for the right to manage those assets over that time, then your pension pot extends from 22 years to 33 years. And this is why this is so exciting, because this is, you know, we are all apparently going to live longer and you know the younger you are the more likely that is so the fact we can so dramatically change the outcome of pension savings is one of the most exciting things i think about the fact that people are now so much more focused on this subject yeah did you want to oh, the rest yeah, of the panel want to lead on that sorry so i think um wealth tech has a very positive impact um from a, from a regulatory point of view. Um, and also as, as a result of things like RDR, um, pension freedoms, obviously there's a lot more complexity in investing now, which probably isn't a good thing, good thing because it's, it's already been viewed as a, a, a hugely complex area. 
But I think the role of, of wealth tech is to engage people in a different way and make sure that um, we're providing journeys that everyone's used to having in, in, in other sectors and other parts of their lives that are engaging intuitive and make sure that people really understand and are educated along the way in terms of investing is quite a simple process really. I have some money that I earn, I have my outgoings and hopefully I've got a little bit left over and I, I want to save for my future. If you can make that process as simple as possible for me and understand as much about me as possible and not just related to one product or all the products I may have from a legacy perspective, then I'm probably going to be a lot more engaged and understand what I'm doing um, on an ongoing basis um, and hopefully invest more as the, when the time's right. But I, I think... The danger is that if, if we stay in the old world and don't embrace technology to enable us to make those solutions intuitive and give people access in the way that we're used to accessing other products and services, then we're just going to scare people off because there's so much more freedom now to do what you want to do. There's so much more complexity and compliance from a regulatory perspective that really what we need to do is embrace technology to, to make that scope if you like come down and put the vision in, in, in a way that, that makes it simple for people to follow because otherwise I think people will either vote with their feet and not get involved in investing at all or they might um, trip over themselves and uh, as we say a little bit knowledge is dangerous and go down the wrong way and then look to blame someone and that's also what, why it's important we believe that advice is a key aspect of that people need to be advised though so how can we make advice more accessible and more affordable for people without chipping away at their investment returns. Lizzie? Yeah, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Technology is an important part of this entire jigsaw uh, because, I mean, I say that from pure B2B, we are a pure tech provider. Considering, I mean, what we do essentially is uh, we have a technology platform where the organizations could input their own investment strategy to create product support portfolios to be able to offer to their customers. Now, that could be used for GIA, general investments, uh, it could be used for ISIS, it could be used for SIPs, etc. Now, if coming back to the pure pension space, taking everything into account, now that, uh, you know, for, for the youngsters to get into the long-term retirement space and all that, they can't access the money is a fundamental piece. And now, being able to educate on that part and the government's new Lisa, the, the lifetime ISA coming into play, I think taking all of that into account, having this liquidity in the retirement space, uh, in a way, if, you, if you're going to tell someone you need to start investing and then you won't have access to it, especially to the youngsters, it's generally a, it's generally a big thing on their, on their mind that you, you're going to give away the money, but you can't touch it for a long, long time to come. So I think the combination of having the LISA to give the liquidity aspect to it and the LISA to give the liquidity aspect to it and the long-term SIPs and all, to be able to bring them all together in a technology platform and to be able to manage it together like that. I think it's a, it's a good thing for the industry and it's a good thing for the young savers to come together and, and we, we, we can deliver that as a technology platform. Uh, that, that's what we do. See, no, and I, all I would add is, that you, look, we have a lot of value to add, I think, in terms of providing transparency, particularly yeah. to assets that have traditionally been managed long term where you can be a bit more opaque maybe on the pricing side. And the business models, broadly speaking, we're talking about are ones that are very, very transparent in terms of their yeah. pricing. And that, I'd argue, is going to be a, a, a powerful thing for, for the industry, for the customer. See, this, this is a good point. I mean, because obviously the pricing is a, is a huge issue with pensions because you know the, the traditional industry has overcharged, I would say, in my view, for this sort of advice in the past. However, one of the things that, that you kind of raised very well, Simon, is the point about communication. Now, pensions are famously unsexy. Um, you know, the only the best way to turn one of your readers off is to put pensions in a headline. It really is. It's just it's not something that people are traditionally very interested in, um, or in fact, they find it intimidating. It's a depressing thing. You, know, you kind of think of yourself as being a flat cap pensioner, kind of eating baked beans. So, I mean, how do you get over that kind of hurdle? How do you, how can wealth tech help people become more engaged to perhaps haven't been in the past? Particularly because now we all do have to take more responsibility for our pensions. We don't have defined benefit schemes by and large anymore. You know, what what can wealth tech do to kind of take the lead there? Well, I think from our part, it's about, as I said, taking customers on journeys that they're used to going on for other products and services. So I know some information about you. You know, some of that comes from whether it's because you're viewing this in a workplace or you're a member of a bank or an advice business. 
I know some stuff about you, you can confirm that. I'm finding more about your aspirations and the things that you want to achieve in your life and in your later life, so leading up to retirement, but, but savings generally. And I'm finding more and more out about you in terms of your attitude to risk, what you believe in, what you don't believe in, you know, your ethics, if you like. So I can actually start to match those things and paint a picture for you around, OK, this is the sort of person you are. This is what you believe in. This is, in, this is what's important to you and what you value. And this is what you're trying to achieve short, medium and long term. I'm now going to help you to map that out. Now, in a traditional face-to-face -face advice business, that would be very expensive because you're sitting face-to-face -face with an advisor, and a lot of that is gathering information. So what we're trying to do, and I think you know, most of, uh, of wealth tech, and so we don't like to call ourselves a robo-advisor because some of the other speakers have said human intervention is critical here. It's about how can we automate the parts of the journey that can be automated, so we're taking all the processing out and allow advisors to do what they do best, which is understand the client and advise them on their specific needs and requirements uh, and make sure they're in the right place and they're getting the sort of uh, returns and experience, if you like, that they're looking for. So I think that automation is absolutely critical. And along with that comes, hopefully, consistency and compliance, which is very important for the advice businesses if they're looking to scale up and take on more people and attract more people in. Yeah. But I think it's the intuitive nature of the, of the solutions, as I said earlier. What will make me want to engage with that and actually start on that journey? I guess from my perspective, <clears throat> you know, we... You know, the industry, it seems to me, at least built itself up in a way of saying, leave it to me, it's really complicated, pay me a lot of money to do it, and <clears throat> maybe I'll give you a good outcome. You know, wealth tech on some level exists to say, look, actually, it's not as complicated, or the range of, it's not as complicated as we said. We're not, don't, don't, don't give us as much money as we originally wanted. We're going to give you an outcome that will, will, will probably be better because it'll be lower cost, and you won't lose very much, if anything, yeah. in terms of the the allocation that you get, you may even do, you, you, you should do better net, net of fees. Um, so you need to kind of put that into your, you know, how you design the journey. Um, you need to reflect that because that's a fundamental shift from where you were 20 years ago to where, where we are today. Yeah. Charlotte? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to challenge your point about pensions being boring and saying I think financial <laughs> services generally are incredibly dull. And, um, and that is one of the reasons why people tend to sort of park their pension and leave it because they find it complicated, they find it boring, they find it slightly scary. And I think this is where technology becomes incredibly powerful because, so, so you know, what, one of the things that we're finding when people come in and go through the journey that we've been talking about is if now you're able to think about, okay, what's my view on inflation over time? And now why don't I change my... Uh, thoughts about inflation as I go through the, this, this technology to say, well, the returns that I'm going to draw out on, on my retirement, I'm now going to inflate not by 2%, but by 2.5%. Or let's have a look at 4%. And recognizing the impact that has on your pot is super important. The same as what is the tax rate that I'm going to be paying on that pot as I withdraw it. You know, what's the difference between whether I'm in a zero tax regime or a basic rate taxpayer or a higher rate taxpayer? And these tools make people suddenly realize that this is a lot more accessible than it's ever been before. And, you know, the irony is, of course, that the government is putting more and more onus on all of us to look after our own long term, um, you know, financial welfare. And it's absolutely critical that we are able to build tools that let people interact with their wealth and to be able to do those that stress testing to figure out, okay, am I on the right path or not? And by the way, that happens today when you first go in, and then you should be able to then stress test over time and see, am I on course or not? And I think actually one of the fantastic things that's happening as we evolve our technologies and as different businesses come to market is that, you know, for the UK community as a whole, the financial investor, the financial consumer, this is probably the single most important thing for them and their, and their families over time is getting this area of financial planning right. Do you think, though, I mean, how much of this can be just automated and how much of it needs to involve the human being at some point because I suppose one of the things I think that people are starting to get to grips with certainly my perception in the consumer market is that with things like ETFs and tracker funds the the low cost argument has 
not been won, but it's certainly in the ascendant. The longer term planning argument in terms of, well, actually, you know, how do I build a port that's big enough to retire at 65 or 75 or 90? Um, and also, what do I do about things like inheritance tax potentially? All that sort of side of things. I mean, to what extent do you think that can be automated, I guess, is uh, the, the big question? Well, I think a great deal of it's automated already. Um, so if, if you go through you know, a classic advice process, so data capture uh, and the fact find is mm. automated, um, and that can be sense checked as well, so that you can have trapdoors that if people are answering questions in a specific way, especially about things like appetite for risk, then you can kick them out to talk to someone to protect themselves yeah. from themselves. So that's all fully automated. Uh, things like going off and getting quotation. So quotation processing is all automated now. That can be done in seconds. Um, I think, and the outcome, if you like, and the suitability report and letter and all of those sort of things, giving people advice on what they should do. That's all automated. I think the key part that you can never automate is that the human factor, if you like, however you can define that, which is... I can tick all these boxes and answer all, I can answer all these questions, but my sort of hopes and fears and feelings, I can only really get across, or if I've got specific things that I'm looking to achieve, talking to another person. And I'll probably only feel comfortable if I've talked to another person on such an important decision. So I'm happy to be taken through the process as far as possible digitally, and I love the fact that it's really quick. I mean, we've got a classic case with one of our distribution partners where we took the at-retirement advice process down, fact find, um, letter editing and, and out to the suitability report and advice out to the client in two hours. But the advisors were sitting on it for a week because they thought, well, if we give it to them in two hours, they're going to think, well, this is a load of old rubbish. <laughs> so, but in other parts of your life, if you book in a hotel, you wouldn't want to wait a week to get the results to say whether you've got that or not. So I think we need to get that mind shift into other parts of our lives whereby actually that's okay and it's automation is good and it's consistent and it's robust and you should embrace it because you use it for basically everything else you buy. And how are you thinking the regulator in terms of that side of things because obviously this is the other slightly tricky area um, you know how much of this can can be taken out of the human side. Um, Look I mean we take responsibility regardless of how mm. it's delivered, right? So let's not pretend that then we can say, no, yes. it, it was the machine that made me do it, right? It doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't work. Right. Um, you know, the regulator, I think, recognizes a, an advice gap and, and a, you know, is looking for ways to close it in a scalable yeah. and sustainable, sustainable way. Um, as far as I can tell, the regulator is unconcerned whether, that, whether the information that the client gives you is delivered kind of face-to-face -face or... You know the the medium doesn't doesn't matter as much, but but let's never pretend that that we can ever blame anybody. But you know, a human at the end of the day, we we'll, we'll have to take responsibility for it. Well, I think from a regulatory point of view, what they're really concerned about is is it consistent, is it compliant, uh, and is it robust. Mm. So as long as you're ticking those three boxes, and uh, as you know, quite rightly said, what we're looking for is scale here. Because I mean, what the scariest stat I heard last year that if defined contribution in the UK was a defined benefit scheme, it's 17% funded. Mm. So that's that terrifying. So we need scale, but also we need to make sure that there's comp the compliance and risk are managed within that scaling up. And, and technology is the only way we're going to guarantee that. And as I said, we embrace it in virtually every other part of our lives. I mean, you've sort of mentioned the defined contribution gap there. I think that's a very good point. But, I mean, whatever wealth else wealth tech can do, uh, you know, it can't magic hop another kind of 80% worth of defined contribution pensions. Uh, I mean, how much of this is about the, uh, the kind of communicating to people that, look, well, you're just going to need to save for longer and you're not going to be able to retire as early. Um, I mean, you know, is, is that going to land with you guys, given that you're also the ones who are, well, not all of you, but you're sort of targeting this, uh, this wider audience? You know, the advice gap has kind of ended up in wealth tech's lap. Uh, but it's all been very segmented for a number of years. I mean, some of the things we were just saying about, you know, why people aren't engaging with pensions necessarily. It's like, I put some money in, I've got a pension, and then I'll just leave it until I'm 65 and open up the box and hope there's enough in there to buy my yacht or my Lamborghini or just to be able to feed myself and my family. And I think actually 
one of the things we're guilty of in the industry is that we've actually embraced that and said, like, right, okay, we don't want to talk to you too often because you might remember you've got some money with us and we want to protect our back book. And so there's a lot of things happening very quickly over the last couple of years, leading up to things like pensions dashboard, data sharing, open banking, that are going to open all of that up yeah. and actually allow us to work in a, in, in a much healthier landscape where information and freedom of information is going to enable us to interact with our customers a lot more clearly, and it will kind of take that cloak and dagger element away, I hope, from financial services. Say, well, look, it's all open here now. We know lots and lots of things about you. It's not just about DC savings. You've got ISAs, or you're not using your ISA pot properly. You've got property. You've got a complete diversified portfolio. Let's bring all that together now, um, because I think one of the key things for me that, that um, the pensions dashboard is going to do is about consolidation, you know, which all the providers are terrified of because they're like, mm, we're back. Yeah. but actually they need to embrace it because if you're providing the best service, then you're going to get the clients. Um, and I think for an individual to have all of these pots of money potted all over the place, no wonder we don't engage with it. I want to see them all in one place and understand what that means and take control of it. And in terms of the business side, obviously this is going to be a very and is a very competitive market, and you know what you're talking about will make it even more so. Um, I mean, how do you differentiate from you know, your business from another one, given that you know to an extent you're saying right, well, we're often low cost, diversified portfolios, which will do fine over the long term. I mean, beyond that, what's the What's the customer sales pitch? What's the promise? What, what gets them to use you rather than someone else? Maybe, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I mean, I think what's been interesting for us since we launched is, you know, we recognise we're a relatively new service, but what has been fascinating is the type of clients coming to us and the amount that they're coming to us with. And so the way I think about it is, you know, these were clients who were, if there are, you know, wealth managers, traditional wealth managers A to E. I mean, I know it's way longer than that. But if I'm with wealth manager A and I have the choice to switch between B, C, D, you know, I'm probably not going to because it's a pain in the backside. You know, I'm going to get a pretty similar service at the one I go to next. The pricing is more or less the same. So why bother? Yeah. What we found is that for clients coming to us, they're coming because actually we genuinely have a proposition that competes with that. So the fact that we have advisors matters a lot for us. Uh, I mentioned the kind of average age of our investors. Um, you know, the average size of our portfolios is well north of £300,000. So, you know, they are people coming from the current traditional wealth managers and saying, finally, there is a solution that meets, you know, what I personally need. And in the case of our demographic, it is, you know, the access to advisors. They may not take it up, but it's the fact they have access. They love the technology. And they are typically people who, you know, despite the fact they're smart professionals, they don't have enough time and often they have no intention of managing their own money. So they know they need to outsource. It's a question of who they're going to do it with. And I mean, in terms of, again, Lo, how in a, in a market that does become more commoditized like that, then how do you kind of say, right, we're the ones to go with as opposed to... No, these guys, you know, how do you market to clients? How do you kind of acquire new customers? Um, sorry. No, it, look, I mean, at some level, it, you know, if you're saying that the, the, the product itself, you know, your argument, you can have the debate, right? The product yeah. will be ultimately uh, differentiated within a relatively narrow band that yeah. be polite to managers, fund managers, right? But, but um, you know, then it has to come down, A, a, a to service, which is, I guess, probably what, what Charlotte would say, and then, and then uh, you know, what else can you do in terms of, you know, helping clients understand their life overall, right? And that a lot of the tools that you, you mentioned are around that, around open banking and around, you know, greater transparency, showing people, you know, what the totality of their assets, if they are prepared to let you see that data, right? So there are a chunk of value-added products that you can you can begin to develop around that. Sure. Good day. Yeah, I wanted to come on that when you use the word commoditization. Right? So uh, we think we are commoditizing the technology piece of this entire jigsaw. Uh, and I and I agree that you know what what will eventually be different would be the service part uh, as well as the investment management part of it, performance of the investments as well as the service will differentiate how, how the customer feels about it. So we are trying to commoditize and uh, going back to the earlier point of automation, I think there's a lot of automation that can be done, and that is already being done. I've got clients who are using a lot of various types of investment strategies, right from life staging to many different types in the pension space to be able to deliver these in the retirement accumulation side of things. 
everyone <coughs> realizes as of today, the issue is more around at retirement decisions. That cannot yeah. be, I mean, that could be, but the, the individual on the opposite side doesn't trust the automation to the level that he can press a button mm. to yeah. make an at retirement decision. But that could be, technologically speaking. So accumulation, I think there's a lot of scope and there's already things being done in many different ways uh, for that accumulation side of things. And taking everything into account, you know, we are trying to commoditize the technology because we think, we, I mean, we fundamentally believe everything that we are doing, we are discussing today in this room is going to become the norm in the future. Becoming the norm in the future means that, you know, how people are saving for their retirement and pensions today is that will not exist. Like how the new age newcomers like the guys on the panel here and everyone is trying to do is the way that things are going to be done in the future. And we require something to be put in place in terms of commoditizing technology, whereas people start to differentiate on the innocent management side of things, generating good innocent performance again, and going back to the fundamentals of delivering good client service. That, that's how I see the space go, going yeah. to work. I mean, on that point, you mentioned the decumulation side and people making choices on retirement. And obviously, there's now a lot more choices to be made on that front, you know, annuities or drawdown, etc. I mean, do you think that there's scope for technology to take some of the pain out of that decision making? Yeah, I mean, it, at this point in time, I see that uh, technology helping in that side of things to the advisor, the human advisor to be able to help him make the right decision because he can't mentally calculate the number of permutations, combinations that exist to give this client who's making an at retirement decision to do what to do next. So in that in that complex situation, I think there's a big help for the human advisor or the institution on the opposite side to give them the toolkit to be able to put all of them together to give the most optimal outcome based on the client requirements. I think that is where I see the value add as of today. Having said that, in 10 or 20 years time, who knows, you know, people are ready to press that retirement buttons online and just forget human advisors altogether. So. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of uh, regulation and also just government intervention in general, and obviously the other thing with pensions is that, you know, every time there's a change of government and sometimes when there's a change of chancellor, some new regime comes along. I mean, pensions freedom, I personally think it's a good idea, but it was a, a massive change in an industry that, you know, has already been kind of turned upside down at least kind of like three or four times in the time that I've just been writing about it. So, I mean, how do you keep flexible? How do you kind of, you know, set up your, your business um, with that in mind that Phil Hammond could turn, you know, stand up in a couple of months and say, everything's changed, guys. You know, or Jeremy Corbyn could just steal the lot. Um, you know, so is, have you got any thoughts on how you kind of handle that kind of business risk? Well, I, think, I think that comes back down again to the great flexibility of technology as, as we use it in other um, sectors and parts of our lives now is that it's not the technology that we're all developing isn't set on savings or pensions or DC or DB or anything in particular. It's based on this is a set of a rules-based system effectively that takes into account legislation, your hopes and fears and needs, um, aspirations, your wealth, affordability, and it uses that to process all of the available information, which is real time, based on what's happening in the world right now, and then we'll give you the best advice based on that. So I think the key thing is things change all the time. You know, DB transfers, you know, are the, one of the big things we're working mm -hmm. on at the moment because yeah. we feel that we've got an automated solution for that or semi-automated solution for that because an advisor absolutely needs to be involved in those complex decisions. But you've got people receiving these great big statements through going, woohoo, I'll have it, please. Based on what? Mm -hmm. you know, how long has it got to last you? What? Inheritance? All of these different things. So automation uh, uh, and the great thing about technology is that whatever happens... That's just a rule change, and it just means that there's another solution that might be better for you now, based on all the information that we've gathered and know about you. Um, but I think automated is, you know, I hate the term robo-advice, because for me it means you're pushing someone all the way through uh, an automated process without any human intervention, um, and saying, well, there you go, good luck, you know, we'll see you at the end, we'll never see you. Whereas I think it's important to have that human intervention for all the reasons we've discussed. But where the financial uh, and the wealth area is becoming so much more complex now and things are changing mm. at speed that's where technology can actually help you to disseminate well, what does that rule change mean and how can I continue to compliantly consistently give advice based on those changes 
I think, you know, what, what I'd add to that, and, and I agree definitely about the point about technology and, and how it can both help self-learning as well as give advisors tools to help their clients. Um, I think the other thing is because there are so many changes, you know, one of the worries I have, and this gets back to an education point that was made earlier, is that what we should all be doing is doing, you know, maximizing on whatever the tax wrapper is around at the moment and not worry about is it going to change mm. because the possibility for it all to be grandfathered, you know, is high. Even if Jeremy Corbyn gets in, you know, the probability that any of your ISA savings are suddenly going to be deemed taxable, very, very unlikely. So the thing that has been interesting to me is that, you know, for example, we had a, a client uh, admittedly reasonably um, at the older end of the spectrum who had a million pounds in ISIS. You know, <laughs> fantastic. So he had just, you know, every single year been going at it and he had also done really well out of the market, um, you know, performing well over that time as well. Other people come in and they have, you know, their ISIS or their pension in cash. And frankly, for the dem demographic I'm talking about, for many of them, though, they're not going to touch that money for the next 15, 20 years. That was a you know, that is not necessarily a good place for them to be because they obviously are not going to have any upside in the market if they keep it in cash, but they are paying significantly for the right to keep it in that wrapper sometimes. So, you know, this does come back to education, which I think, you know, was talked about earlier. I think technology in the different ways that we've also just discussed it can have um, very beneficial effects. And, you know, whether Jeremy Corbyn or whoever gets in and, and things, yeah. they'll continue to change whatever happens. And, and I think, you know, as we were saying, technology can only help with respect to then dealing with those changes. No, I mean, I, from, from my perspective, you have to, you know, it becomes a discussion for the CTO about how well yeah. he or she builds that, builds that platform. <laughs> It, yeah, government risk is, is, is it's, it's, it's relevant for our, for our market exposure as, as well, as, well as, our, as our business exposure. And it's, there's a limit to the extent to which you can diversify that away. Yeah. Um, they're the best thing you can do, right, is produce a robust business that's adding value to your customers and then you know, try and put that case forward as best you can. Sure. And Well, um, I was going to ask you about the low rate environment, uh, but I think uh, we'll move on to questions from the, 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 the floor. Um, does anyone have any questions for the panel about pensions and wealth tech? Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm going to get my voice back first. Um, it's a session, session on pensions, and it's surprisingly not mentioned automatic enrolment yet, uh, which is five to six million. I mean, have we, I mean, from my side, we, have, we don't do anything in that space, but I've seen other firms uh, using technology to partner with a uh, few providers who already serve some sort of HR solutions to employers who are already partnering with them and uh, adding this as an add-on. And I think there are a few firms out there, but uh, the industry might know a lot more market intelligence on that space. But. I think the danger with auto-enrolment, although it's a wonderful thing because it's got many people saving for the first time, is that they're probably doing it blind and don't even realise they're doing it in many cases. Um, and the danger that we found working with large employers is that um, the perception of the employee is, well, I've got a pension now, I don't have to worry about, everything's going to be fantastic and I'm going to have this long, happy retirement without any idea at all of what does it actually mean from an income perspective for them when they want to retire or anything. So the, the thing that we're promoting, uh, certainly with our more forward-thinking customers, uh, uh, employ large employer clients, is auto enrolment's fantastic. It's a beginning. It means you actually embrace and realise that you're going to have to save for yourself because the state's not going to fund everything anymore. However, that's all it is. It's a beginning. So let's use that to help get you further engaged in. So what does it actually mean? You're doing this now. You're giving us some money. Don't you want to find out what that means? and start to build yourself a financial plan of which this will be an important part of, but it's a start, not an end. Um, and I think 
as an industry and also from a government perspective, we should be m promoting that much more strongly that auto enrolment hasn't fixed everyone's problems. It's the beginning of a savings plan and now we need to embrace that and get people more and more and more engaged. I will do that. Also, one more question. One more question. Sorry. I, was, I was wondering if you need to have uh, um, higher capital requirements at the No different. It's the same. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, look, thanks everyone. Um, thank you to the panel and thank you to the audience. Uh, and we shall now let you escape. <laughs>